we are picking back up in Fahrenheit 451. We are getting super duper close. We're on the last two sections of reading and then we'll be done. Easy peasy. Um, so this week what you guys are going to be reading is pages 97 through 127. And if you've already read, which you already should have by now, you know that this is a super, super intense part of the book. Um, this is where all of the action goes down. So if you haven't read, go ahead and pause this video and then go back and read it because you definitely don't want to miss what's going on. Um, so just to recap about what's kind of been going on before, if you remember, Montag is um, has just come back from Faber's house and he has Faber in his ear talking to him and um, Mildred's friends have just come over and they're talking about um, all of their children and their life and it's very vain and very um, who really cares about anybody in this world. If you remember, if you remember Montag gets very very upset and so he starts reading a poem and we kind of left off where one of Mildred's friends gets very upset, starts crying and Montag ends up burning the book in the incinerator. And so we're kind of going through page 97 and we're continuing onwards. Um, Mildred, if you kind of go on page 98, you'll see that Mildred is um, probably not super happy with Montag at this point because not only is he hoarding books, which she doesn't seem to really understand, he also was not very nice to her friends. And so um, she actually goes into the bathroom and she and he hears her shaking up the sleeping tablets pill bottle. So we already know that Mildred has a habit of overdosing on those. So that's not a good scenario to even start off with. Um, all right, so as we continue on into page 100, um, it's kind of starting to go into the scene where Montag goes back to the firehouse. And as we've covered before, if you remember, Beatty would be expecting Montag to bring back a book because he allowed Montag to keep this one book as a um as sort of like hey you can investigate what's been going on in these books but then you'll come to the realization that everybody does that books aren't really worth it and so he's expecting montag to have come to this realization and to come and to give him the book to be burned so montag goes in he's very very nervous but he has faber in his ear um kind of talking to him calming him down um, so why is Montag so nervous in this scene? What do you think? So he's, um, he's kind of coming into the firehouse and if you remember the plan that Faber and Montag had was to put books in the um, firemen and the firehouses so that it could kind of destroy the system from the inside out. So he's kind of playing um, secret agent right here or at least secret spy kind of spying on and letting Faber see what's going on in the firehouse. Um, so when it's talking about the salamander that slept, um, basically that's just a key word for a fire truck. So you'll kind of notice that they kind of don't really use the normal words that you would expect. Like later on in this section of the reading, it talks a lot about a beetle um, racing. That's basically just a car. So I'm not entirely sure why um, Ray Badbury chose to put it in that way. Perhaps he chose to do it maybe because um, it kind of gives an otherworldly, instead of just saying like a truck, a car, he kind of wants it to seem more like clinical and like give human qualities to these things. Perhaps that's why he chose to do that. So as we're kind of going on, um, they're sort of just talking about um, Beatty, and this whole paragraph, I'm looking at page 103. On page 103, there's that whole middle paragraph. And if you read it, it might seem super confusing. So I'm just gonna kind of break it down. So what basically he's doing is he's talking to Montag about a dream that he had. And in this dream, Montag is trying to convince Beatty by using quotes from books on why books and learning are important. And Beatty is refuting every single one of his claims by repeating back a book quote to refute. So he's basically using his own tactics against him. And that's a really big deal because um, it kind of messes with, with Montag's mind a lot 
because he's thinking, well, if the books say that knowledge and individualism and individual thought is good, but what if they also say that it's not good? And so that's kind of what he's been doing throughout page 103 um, into 104. And that kind of goes along with this quote on page 104. What traitors books can be? You think they're backing you up and then they turn on you. And then um, as they kind of end that scene, Faber has obviously been listening to this whole exchange this whole time. And he says, all right, Montag, so you've heard what Beatty has to say. Um, give me just a moment and I'm going to tell you my point of view and you need to decide. Are you going to go with me on like the rebel forces into individualism and individual thought? Or are you just going to stick with the majority of people and kind of be a sheep, be brainwashed into this? Um, and that's sort of where that quote comes from on page 104. Oh God, the terrible tyranny of the majority. So he, remember back to Beatty's original speech, he talks all about the whole reason why this has come into play is because minorities were complaining. And so once minorities started to complain, they started censoring and censoring and censoring until everybody's the same. But Faber is pointing out that it's not good if everybody's the same either. If we just listen to the majority, then, then you just kind of get lumped into everybody else and there's no such thing as individual thought. So there's kind of that foreshadowing into this commentary that you see on page 104. Um, so we're kind of going along and then at the end of page 106 we get to the big shocker of a scene that the bell rings and they jump into their fire truck the salamander and they're rushing off and all of a sudden they get to a house and Montag is having this internal conflict. He's thinking, oh my gosh, like I, now that I know all of these things, there's no way that I can go into this house and burn these books. I just, I can't do it. And then he looks up and they're at his house. Crazy. And so what's gonna happen? So this kind of is revealed in page 107 that Beatty knows about these books that Montag has secretly been hiding at his house. Um, didn't I hint enough when I sent the hound to your place? So remember when um, Mildred and Montag were reading the books together that there was a sniffing of like a dog at the door? That was the mechanical hound. And Beatty was sort of sending a warning to them like, hey, I know what's been going on. And then we get to page 108 and we get to Mildred walking out of the door. She runs past him with her bag in hand and she just gets into the car and says, it's all done. Everything is all gone. And gets in the car and doesn't even look back. So, Mildred, you didn't turn in the alarm, did you? You didn't report all of these books to me. She doesn't even bother answering. Hmm, I think that that would probably be the ultimate betrayal for the person who you're married to, who you trusted with this information. And it's kind of like the final straw for Montag and Millie's marriage um, is that she ended up betraying him, which if you predicted that, you were ended up being right. Um, so it's kind of going on and Faber is saying, hey, like, why can't you run away? Like, what's, what's going on? Why can't you run away? And he can't because the mechanical hound is out there. And um, so basically what ends up happening is uh, Beatty ends up saying to Montag, hey, you are going to be the one to destroy this house. So he goes through and on page 110, he's going through and he's burning everything in his house. So the question that I want you to answer in the Google Forms for this week, um, for the video notes, is what do you think the, the fire symbolized for Montag as he was burning his house? So keep in mind, he's not just burning um, the books. He's burning the video screens that Millie always watched. He's burning the house that he lived in. Um, and his whole life, his entire life of being a fireman and living in this community is burning. So what, if you had to guess, what do you think this symbolism is that Ray Bradbury was trying to point out? And then as we go into 111, we see that Montag would be under arrest. Why would he be under arrest? 
because he had the books and he refused to give them all back to the fire station. And that sort of just proves that he ends up being like Clarice. BD did not have some very nice things to say about Clarice and it kind of sounds like BD is suspecting Montag of being just like her. So as we're going along, um, there, it's revealed that yes, Mildred was the one who sounded the alarm, as well as her friend. So either way, he would have been caught. Um, and then the scene comes up where Faber is talking in the ear and BD sees. And so he takes the earpiece and he threatens Faber. He threatens, hey, I'm gonna come down and I'm gonna hunt you down and I'm gonna figure out where this guy lives. And that's sort of where Montag, something clicks in his mind. And he decides that I can't let this happen. So I don't know if you caught this part, but on page 113, Montag burns Beatty to death with a flamethrower that's in his hand. I mean, I couldn't even imagine watching that happen, especially somebody who is my boss and who I had worked for for so many years, and all of a sudden you're murdering them, and especially in that way, it's extremely gruesome. And um, now Montag is kind of freaking out. He is, um, he is um, threatening the other firemen who are around, and then all of a sudden he turns around and he sees the mechanical hound racing towards him. And the, the mechanical hound manages to just barely stab Montag in the leg and numb his whole leg until uh, Montag destroys the mechanical hound with the flamethrower. So it really wasn't smart, if you think about it, why BD decided to give the flamethrower to Montag. Like if you're trying to arrest somebody and you're um, they're thinking that they're not a great guy, I probably wouldn't give them a flamethrower as like, hey, this is your option to get out. Um, you can't really fight against a flamethrower. Um, okay, so Montag is running away. Um, his, not, his leg is completely numb from the mechanical hound, so that's why he's kind of talking about it. Um, I won't get too much into his reasonings because that's on your quiz, but I really want you to read especially um, you know, once we get through Didi's death and then getting into page 116, 117, um, it's kind of going into page 119 and 120 when it talks about this empty boulevard. So this scene might be a little bit confusing if you don't really remember super clearly what happened earlier on in the book. So earlier on in the book, well, first off, when they mentioned the war being started, I think I talked about that in one of my other videos, but basically they had always been talking about this war being started um, and how there were all these tensions of this far off war being started and he manages to hear about, hey, the war being started, but it's kind of weird because I don't even seem to care about it. It's kind of like how the United States government released all these UFO videos and nobody really seems to care because of coronavirus. Um, the same sort of thing is going on here. So he comes to this boulevard, and if you remember, Mildred had said that she likes to drive super, super fast, like 100 miles an hour down the road. And so that's what a lot of people do to kind of numb their feelings. They just get in the car and they just drive as fast as they can without any really kind of a thought about like who's on the road or anything like that. And that's why um, Montag is so afraid to cross the road. It's just because A, um, he's being hunted down. There are cops who are out there looking for him. The mechanical hound is out there looking for him. And then also, if somebody sees him on the road, they can report him. And then also B, people drive super fast on this road. If he's crossing, it's pretty good chance that he could get hit. I mean, that's how evidently Clarice died. And so he ends up, hey, I'm gonna fix myself up so I don't really necessarily look like this guy that they're projecting out on the TV screens. Um, so he does that and then he's trying to cross the road and off in the distance, there's a beetle or a car and he thinks at first that it's the cops. The cops are racing towards him and it looks like he's, they're just about to hit him. And then one second later, he trips and falls and they manage to swerve around him and miss him. And 
you kind of get the idea that this is just a group of kids, it's not even the cops, that these kids are just going for a joyride and their goal was to murder him. What sort of kids, I mean, it's hard to think of people nowadays, even teenagers or kids, thinking about just going out and being like, oh, for the in all intent purposes, I'm just gonna murder somebody. But if you think about it like as a video game, if all you're used to seeing your entire life is a video game and a video goes screen, screen, and you're just used to um, people teaching you through a screen, it kind of doesn't seem super real or super immoral to just kind of do whatever you want. And so I kind of want you to keep that in mind when you're kind of confused, like why would the kids do that? Um, all right, it kind of goes on and he ends up making it to Faber's house. And at the very end, getting into page 127, they start to sort of make a plan about the future and Montag, and um, sorry, Faber gives some advice to Montag on what she, he could do next. And they are listening to the news and it is released on the news that the mechanical hound, that a new one is out and it is ready to find Montag. And so that's kind of where we ended up on this week's reading. Um, it's a very intense part of the book. It's all the action and then it continues on into this last section, which you will read next week. So just a note really quickly on the research paper. This last week is the last week that you have to do anything for the research paper. Woo! So what you guys have to do is just go back through, look at my email with your edits. I want you to go through, make the edits, email me. Um, I'm also available for Google Meet if you really need me to walk you through your paper. Like you're not really sure what you're doing wrong, I can do that for you too. Um, just email me and let me know and you are going to be um, turning in your final draft, which by the way is 15% of your grade. Um, on turn it in please turn it in to turn it in because it's harder for me to go through and download everybody's and manually submit it so please make sure to do that and then after that you're totally done with your research paper you've officially written if not your first um, one of your first research papers so you should be really proud of that accomplishment and I will see you guys on YouTube next week